FOMO. This paper came out, the famous JAM study that showed that when you offer people a lot of options, they're very attracted to the display, but they don't buy any. And this was the first evidence that there can be too much choice. I'm Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. And it's why some people end up following the crowd when they should be blazing a trail of their own. But if you want to achieve greatness in business and life, you've got to break free. Come on, I'll show you how. This is FOMO Sapiens, where we explore how entrepreneurial thinkers find the inspiration and the courage to build exceptional lives. Welcome back to season 11 of FOMO Sapiens, the show for entrepreneurial thinkers. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, and today we are talking to Barry Schwartz, the author of the seminal book, The Paradox of Choice. I read that book when it came out. I loved it. It changed my thinking. And then a friend introduced me to Barry, and as you will see, we vibe. Now, if you aren't familiar with Barry, he is an emeritus professor of psychology at Swarthmore College and a visiting professor at the Haas School of Business at Berkeley. He has spent 50 years thinking about and writing about the intersection between economic psychology and morality. He's written several books that address this interaction, including The Battle for Human Nature, The Costs of Living, Paradox of Choice, Practical Wisdom, and more recently, Why We Work. And he has spoken four times at the TED conference with TED Talks having been viewed by more than 25 million people. So he's an incredible guy. This conversation's fantastic. It's about decision-making, one of our favorite topics, and so in line with taking bigger swings, the theme of the season, because if you don't know what you want and you can't decide, you cannot swing at anything. All right, now, we're gonna go straight into the interview today. I have a new opening question for this season. Gotta keep it spicy. So I started our conversation by asking Barry this. Tell me something unexpected you learned about yourself that changed everything. What I learned about myself was that I would never be the starting center fielder for the New York Yankees or the point guard for the New York Knicks. Uh, that was the future that I envisioned. But, you know, I was five feet tall at that time and uh, very, very, very wide and it was clear that my future was not going to be in uh, professional sports. So I had to look around for something else to do with my time. Thank God that you did because, <laughs> listen. I don't know. The Knicks could have used me if I were any good. The Knicks that could use anybody at this me. point. That's, that's for <laughs> sure. So I'm very excited to have you here. You wrote a book that uh, I remember reading, kind of blew my mind when I read The Paradox of Choice. And then you have had more than 25 people watch your TED Talks. You have done something 25 really. 25 people? 25 million. 25 million. million. Yes, it's yeah. amazing. I probably watched it 25 times, just me. <laughs> but you've done something that's really hard to do in this world, especially in the academic world, which is that you've, you've created something that has really gone wide. And I want to start there because, you know, why is it, do you think, that this topic the paradox of choice really has just, you know, it's become such a perennial focus for people. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, it, when I initially suggested it, it was almost regarded as nonsensical because what an economist would say is if you add options and I don't care, I'll ignore them. And so you haven't made my life any worse. On the other hand, somebody who does care may find something that they want that was previously not available. And so anytime you add options, you make somebody's life better. You make nobody's life worse. So just keep adding options. And here I am suggesting, well, no, I mean, there's something good about adding options, but there's a dark side to it. And so it was regarded as really almost a violation of the ideology that governs you know, de democratic life and the, the exaltation of freedom. And then about six months after the book came out, there was an editorial in the New York Times. I don't remember what the topic was, but there was one sentence that said, and as everybody knows, there can be too much choice. So it went from being ridiculous to being self-evident in the space of half a year 
and you know the book has really had legs. It's twenty years almost, and uh, I still get emails. I still get invited to, by people like you to talk. And the reason is that as bad as the problem was when I wrote the book, it's much worse now. It's pervaded every aspect of life, and uh, the uh, digital age has essentially eliminated transaction costs. So. You know, you won't go from one store to another to another to another fighting New York traffic. Eventually, you'll just pick something from some store. But now you can sit like we're sitting and examine thousands of options without raising your heart rate, although you will certainly raise your blood pressure. Um, So so it's just become pervasive. Uh, And I think people, you know, a lot of the emails I've gotten over the years, what they say is, thank you so much for putting a name on something that I've been experiencing um, and for showing that it isn't just me. And that, that I think really is, is why the book has has had the kind of influence that it's had. It's, it identified something that a lot of people were experiencing and misunderstanding. Uh, And I helped them to understand it. Not unlike, by the way, FOMO. Well, in fact, you. you should know that it was at a, I was giving a talk about my book and after I was finished, somebody raised a hand and, and asked the question, this sounds like FOMO. And I said, what's FOMO? I'd never heard the term. And now, as you can attest, it's pervasive. Everybody knows what it means. And, and of course, a lot of what I had to say in my book is exactly that idea when there are so many options, it's almost impossible to avoid fear of missing out. And the result is that either you don't pull the trigger because you don't want to miss out on something better, or you do whatever you do and you're convinced that just around the corner there was something that was better if only you had waited. And so you spend your life mostly thinking about a perfect next decision rather than making any decisions at all. Yeah, it's such a personal thing because it's the the reason why this stuff is so pernicious in my mind is because it's all the little things and all the daily decisions that we have to make. And as you pointed out correctly, internet culture, internet life has really accelerated that. If we if we think about, I went on to Amazon one day and I and I looked for white shoelaces and there were a thousand. <laughs> white shoelaces you're at the point where like you just don't even want to bother it's like you know screw i'll just i'm just gonna you know like find a way to use some string that i find in the bottom of my closet somewhere so it is everywhere i want to go back to the early days when you formulated this idea Mm -hmm. because what's so beautiful about your this is i mean the, the other reason i think why it's done so well is because not only is it something that we all feel on a daily basis and then when it's presented to us it's so it feels so you obvious. You're like, of course, that makes a ton of sense to me. But also it's one of these things that, you know, if you think about it, it's just so, while it feels so obvious once you've heard it, like you said before, it is counterintuitive. It's like going against conventional wisdom. How did you actually, like, I guess in the context of your work as a professor and, and, and a, a thinker, how did this come up? So the, the longer answer to your question than maybe you want is that I have always been a critic of the sort of economist view about, and the free market view about how life should be organized. You know, I think the market is cruel and hurts a lot of people. And yes, there are benefits, but the costs are very substantial. Uh, And so I've been a persistent critic of that kind of market-based thinking about how society should work. And, And every time I make that argument, someone would say, yes, but freedom, the market caters to freedom. And I would, you know, open my mouth and nothing would come out because it did. You know, who's to tell me whether I want chunky peanut butter or smooth peanut butter? Damn it, I'm going to decide this for myself. And the more things are out there, the more you enhance freedom. And it's not just about stuff. It's also about lifestyle decisions and career decisions and, you know, all kinds of really big things. So I was stumped. And then this paper came out, the famous JAM study, that showed 
that when you offer people a lot of options, they're very attracted to the display, but they don't buy any. And this was the first evidence that there can be too much choice. It was a study done by Sheena Iyengar, uh, you know, 25 years ago. And this is what got me going, because now there was empirical evidence that the one argument stopper against me was a very mixed blessing. And freedom was good, but there can be too much of a good thing. And we were moving every day faster and faster to creating exactly that situation. So I started looking around for evidence that was consistent with that view. And of course, there was a lot of evidence, but no one had put it together in exactly this way, because as you put it, the received wisdom was so strong that it just wouldn't occur to anyone to put their finger on that as a source of the problem. FOMO. FOMO. Sheena Iyengar, yeah, that that study is it. Uh, you mention it in the book, and she's actually been a guest on the show. Uh-huh. So I was, we had a nice conversation about these these topics. What is so interesting to me is so yeah, you 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 wrote the book. It was deeply influential, made the TED Talk. People watch it, and yet, and yet, I think about companies out there like Apple, for example. There was a time, very famously, when you could fit all of Apple's products on one table, and they were killing it. Now you go to the Apple store, I mean, the amount of choice, just in terms of the iPhone line, it's stressful. You go to the typical retailer or company, and they are totally rejecting this very, very sensible insight that you have sort of brought to bear. Why? I'm sure you work with companies all the time. People call you up talking about, like, why why don't we just listen to the advice that you've given us? I have a feeling... I've done less talking to companies than you might think. Um, but when I have talked to companies... Well, they should be calling you. That's all I can say. When I have talked to companies, there I find that there's a kind of a split. Uh, the younger people, you know, people in their 40s, not quite corner office, but almost corner office, resonate. And they see in what I'm saying a future path that's very different from the current path. The older people are so steeped in the kind of orthodoxy of marketing that they simply can't imagine that what I'm saying should actually influence what they do. So what has happened, I've noticed often, is that people make changes for completely different reasons and discover the changes are incredibly successful. And then I come and give a talk and it helps them understand why the changes were successful. I'll give you one concrete example, a huge uh, builder of housing developments. And the standard is, their standard procedure was there'd be six or seven model homes. You'd pick the one you wanted and then you'd go to the design center and outfit it. You know, and there were a million styles of kitchen tile and bathroom fixtures and rugs and you name it. And they would spend an average of 20 hours with each customer in this design center. And it was very expensive. In addition to maintaining the inventory of all these different options. So they decided they would streamline what they offered. And their hope was that it wouldn't cost them much in sales. And what they found is sales went up, home sales went up, upgrades went up, and consumer satisfaction went up. And they just, you know, they were prepared for things to go down, and their hope was that it would go down less than the amount of money they were saving. And much to their amazement, everything went up. So they were offering people less and people somehow thought they were offering, being offered a better product. So they couldn't figure out how, why this happened. So I get invited to give this talk and I give my talk on the problem of too many options. And it's like you can see the light bulbs going on over everybody's head in the audience. So that often happened. People will make a change for another reason and discover that there are benefits to that change. And there are counterexamples, right? In the U.S., Trader Joe's is remarkable for two things, very limited options, and people walk out of Trader Joe's with a bigger smile on their face than they walk out of any other supermarket. 
you know, and I don't think they did that because they somehow knew that there was a paradox of choice problem. They did it to manage inventory and be able to maintain low price, competitive prices and so on. But the non Walmart model has proven to be extremely successful. And, um, there's a supermarket chain called Aldi, which I think has some presence in the U S but is massive yep. in Europe. And they do the same thing. You know, there's basically the Aldi brand of everything. And, it, you know, instead of taking three hours to shop the way it might at Walmart, it takes you 10 minutes. And is their tomato sauce, the best tomato sauce you could get? Probably not. Is it good enough uh, to cover your spaghetti? Almost certainly. Yes. And you've, uh, you know, you have found an extra hour in your day to do other things. So, but mostly you're right. I think what's going on is that when somebody comes into your store and says, do you have an X? And the answer is no. The lost sale is extremely salient. On the other hand, when somebody comes into your store and buys $20 worth of stuff instead of 60 because you've tortured them, that's not salient because, after all, they come to the checkout and they bought stuff. So you don't know that they would have bought more if you'd made the, the decisions less of a problem. So it's very salient when somebody says, do you have it? And you have to say no. It is not salient when somebody says, doesn't say anything, just walks to the checkout completely worn out and, you know, buys a third of what would otherwise be purchased. So it's partly, I think that it's very interesting. You you bring up the Aldi uh, example because the hard it's a hard discount model. Is it, it comes from Germany uh, originally, and I, I know this deeply well because I tried to do a, a similar concept in Turkey. I invest in this company, but we had too many things and we failed, and it was very poorly executed. It was a disaster. But I remember studying this model, and not only is it that you have a slim down, very select set of choices. But because of that, the complexity of the business is lower. You can make things, everything is private label, so you can make it cheaper. So it's like this very well thought out of thing that comes out of Germany. And it makes me think about the cultural element of this because you, 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 you kind of hit it coming in. In America, we associate more choice with freedom. It's like an American value. I want to be able to like, I want 50 of these things. I want to go to the store and I want to have everything I could ever want. And I want to buy more and more and more. And of course that is changing generationally. I think people, whether it's because they're worried about the environment or just, they just kind of sick of all the stuff we have, you know, we have had some changes there, but when you think about the cultural elements, your book's been sold all over the world. How do you think about, about different societies and how they view choice? There's no quite, there's a very interesting study that was done uh, at Stanford where People see like a five minute video of somebody doing very mundane things, comes home from work, gets into comfortable clothes, makes a snack. That's it. No sound. You're just watching this person do very ordinary things. And when the video is over, you ask the people who've watched it, how many decisions did this person make? And the interesting thing is that Americans will say 25. If you ask People from India who watch exactly the same video, they'll say three. So built into the kind of mindset of Americans is everything's a choice and everything should be a choice. Built into the mindset of in, people in India is, is a whole different sort of map of the world. Most things are not choices. Most things are the product of habit or tradition or what have you, but the choices leap out and life, the point of life is not to maximize the amount of choice people have. The point of life is to fit in to a community, to a family, to a religious tradition, what have you, largely do what you're supposed to do. Uh, and that comes from other sources than yourself. And that's all of that is re pretty much regarded as anti-American. And it's kind of interesting now in the U.S. with this political cultural clash that we're experiencing, that there's a kind of sentiment on the right that there's too much choice in people's lives. And we really need to tell people what books to read, 
what gender to be, and so on. And it's kind of ironic that this thrust is coming from the strongest defenders of the free market, historically. You know, they think it's fine for there to be uh, 500 different kinds of cereal on the shelf. They just don't think it's fine for there to be books that talk about trans people or gay people uh, or choices about what to do with your pregnancy and so on. So there's a kind of open up the market as much as you possibly can, but close down the culture as much as you possibly can. We'll see how that plays out. It is not, it's not playing out very well at the moment. FOMO. FOMO. Wow, that's really interesting. It, 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 it kind of, it's funny because it, it's like, uh, it's a desire to go back in time when the sets of choices were more about what was at the grocery store yeah. than what it, it, and it, so I never thought about that before. That's really provocative. Now I do want to talk about, so we were talking earlier about the notion of too much choice, but obviously choice is important. And yep. so how does one think about like, say, you know, f for somebody who's listening, who's maybe an entrepreneur and they started out a company and they're selling their one thing, like they're selling socks, and those socks are doing great, and they have two colors. And all of a sudden, they start hearing for customers, you know what I'd love? I'd love stripey socks. Well, I would love socks that are, you know, fleece lined, whatever. And there is that temptation to all of a sudden, yeah. you're selling 137 types of socks, and we yeah. know that's too much. How does one figure out what these appropriate amount of choice? So I think the answer to that is, I wish I had an easy answer. The answer to that is, it's basically empirical. There's no, you know, there is a sweet spot, but it's not like you can say the sweet spot is 10 options. No matter what it is you're looking for, the right number is 10. If you're looking for a car, if you're looking for socks, if you're looking for a job, the right number is 10. That's certainly not true. It'll depend on the individual who's doing the looking. If you're a car fanatic, you probably like having as many options as possible and you pour through all the specs. You know, it gives you a thrill. It's not it's not a chore. It's it's a pleasure. Uh, if you're indifferent about that, then it's torture. Uh, so it probably depends on the person and it certainly depends on the, the particular thing you're choosing about. And so I think the only way an entrepreneur can figure this out is the hard way. You do the experiment. At some, if your eyes are open, you will reach a point where you've given people a headache rather than an opportunity to get exactly what they want, and then you start to dial down the uh, the number of options. So you're you're in the sweet spot. There have been a couple of studies that suggest eight, ten items is the sweet options is the sweet spot, but they were about really trivial choices, and I would be very reluctant to suggest that that's the model for choice in general. That is really interesting, though, just to think about that, that the more basic a product is where you can't have an aficionado, offering less is probably the right answer. Mm -hmm. And when you're getting to things that are highly customized where your consumer, the purchase, like the process of buying and selecting is almost part of the qualities, attributes of the of the good that the person wants, that offering more actually makes them enjoy it more. That, exactly. that that makes a ton of sense to me. And of course, then you can run the tests in between because you know nowadays, of course, like you can crunch data on anything. Yeah. You can run the tests all you want to figure out what that optimum level is. No, no, that's exactly right. So for example, take Amazon when Amazon was just a bookseller, if you can remember that far back. Um, I do, I do. You know, and they had their top, their 20 best sellers. We tried to get them to do an experiment for two days. And instead of presenting 20 best sellers, present 10. And our prediction was that they would sell more when they presented a top 10 than when they presented a top 20. We couldn't get them to do the experiment, unfortunately, which is too bad because they would have collected enough data like in two hours to, to answer the yeah, question. Yeah, seriously, come on, Amazon. But, but you know, what? for example, what car manufacturers have done, and I think this comes from Japan, is they offer the bargain one, the middle one, and the luxury one. So what they're doing is they're offering cars that come with a package of options. Now, you can special order a car and pick and choose 
But they, you know, their research tells them this package sort of coheres and this package up here coheres and this one. So for the people who don't want to get bogged down, it's a choice among three options. And it's about what you care about and what you can afford. And for people who do care, you can custom tailor your car and wait three months for it to be delivered. Now, it also saves them a fortune because they can actually produce these cars when they only have three versions, three flavors to produce instead of 300, uh, much, much more economically. So that's a model. You can customize, but you don't have to customize. And it's a model that I think mostly is not taken advantage of as much as it should be. I love that idea. And, you know, you could even charge the customizer, the more customizer, more, and they'll probably be happy because they think they're getting, people love paying more for something. It's like, it's it's just (laughs) insane, but true. Well, you know, there is this sense that the quality of what you buy is directly reflected by the price that you pay. Yeah. So the more expensive it is, the better it must be. Now, Barry, I do want to, I don't want to miss this opportunity, miss out as it were on asking you, you know, in, so obviously in our prior conversation, you told me because this is, you know, your work, you're very careful about, you don't, you don't fall into the trap of the paradox of choice in your own personal life. And that's how I'm with FOMO. I, I mean, I have tons of FOMO, but I try to be judicious about how I deal with it. But for folks that are listening and saying, okay, this is something that I I am dealing with. What would be your, a couple of pieces of advice for folks? So the most, I think the single most important piece of advice I can offer is this. In my book and in research I've done with collaborators, we've made a distinction between two approaches to making a choice that are quite different. One approach is find the best. We call people who have this approach maximizers. Another approach is find good enough. And we call people who follow this approach satisficers. Now, as a satisficer, you can have low standards or you can have high standards. But once you find something that meets your standards, you stop looking. And that makes a huge difference because if you're out to find the best, you have to look at every option. Otherwise, how do you know what's the best? And in the modern world, looking at every option is simply impossible. And so eventually you pull the trigger. You know, I have to buy a pair of jeans. I can't be seen in public with the jeans I currently wear. So eventually you pull the trigger, but you think about all these play, all these sources that you haven't looked at. And every day as you put your jeans on, you're convinced that you've settled for something less than the best. So whereas if you're a satisficer, you don't have to search everything. You just search until you find what meets your standards. If you're lucky, the first thing you look at will meet your standards and that'll be the end of it. So the most single most useful piece of advice I can give, I think, is appreciate that good enough is virtually always good enough. And stop feeling the need to find the best. This is not easy advice to follow because it seems like if you're if you're looking for good enough, you're just settling. And there's better out there. And damn it, why don't you put in the time and effort to find it? Second, choose when to choose. Take advantage of your network of friends. You need a new cell phone. A friend just got a new Apple phone. Call your friend up. Do you like the phone? Yes. Get an Apple phone. Is it the best phone for you? Maybe not. Does it matter? Certainly not. You know, so you can sort of you can sort of delegate the decision making to people in your circle who are have made similar decisions. Now we do that to some degree by looking at recommendations and reviews, but you know, we don't know anything about the people who are writing these reviews. They may not even be people, right? They might be bots. So taking advantage of your social network uh, so that the number of decisions you actually face is reduced will make life a lot easier. And the last piece of advice is to try to manage expectations. And this is extremely hard. In a world where you've got Lees and Levi's, only a fool expects jeans that will fit perfectly. In a world that has 2,000 different jeans manufacturers, it's perfectly reasonable to think that one of them will fit perfectly. And so your expectations about how good the pair of jeans you buy are going to be 
keep going up. And so you finally buy one. And what you ask is not, is this good? But is this as good as I expected it to be? And if your expectations are on the roof, the answer to that question is always going to be no. And so, you know, I say sometimes when I give talks, the secret to happiness is low expectations. That's a bit of an overstatement. The secret to happiness is realistic expectations. And of course, everything around us is encouraging us to have unrealistic expectations. So if people can do those three things, good enough is good enough. Let other people make some choices for you and manage expectations. I think a lot of the problem that my book is about will be uh, will be reduced. FOMO. FOMO. Yeah, that that makes a ton of sense. And I just want to comment on number two, which is really, you know, outsourcing decision making, which I do a ton of like I decide nothing anymore unless I care. But I really don't care about many things, apparently. That's right. But but what I do, it is interesting because you mentioned reviews. And what I find so annoying is you're looking to buy something and you Google it and then Every dumb website, Esquire, GQ, CNET, they're all in the business of doing affiliate links with reviews that like may or may not be real or they may be biased or whatever. It's hard to find the unbiased. The one place that I truly go to, and I went there just like an hour ago because I was buying something for somebody for for a gift, is Wirecutter, the New yeah. York Times Wirecutter. And they, I swear to God, they have, they just, they anything you could want to buy, like whether it's a spatula or a mattress. I mean, I've used it for all that stuff. So that one's a good one. And I do use that a lot, but otherwise, you know, it, it's, it's crazy how there's like a whole cottage industry of lousy reviews on the internet. My I know. I, and I, I use wire cutter too. And I also use, um, consumer reports, which is the old fashioned of version of wire cutter. Kicking it old school. I like it. But you know, the interesting thing about consumer reports is shortly after my book came out, they had me come over and give a talk. And, and their standard article, this is in the days when people actually read it rather than looking at it online, their standard article would include a gigantic table that listed- With the little circles filled in. Yes. With little circles, you know, 50 yeah. brands, down, 50 options down the left yeah. column, and then ratings on, on 25 dimensions. And, that, you know, and they didn't make recommendations. They just gave you the data. And I said, listen- you're doing this exactly wrong. Your article should be about the three that you recommend. And you can bury this table so that only crazy people who really want to get into the teeth of it will be bothered by it. And what you're telling the rest of us is you should get A, B, or C based on our evaluation. So you have the same information that's in the articles now, but what you feature is the recommendations and what's in the background is the data that the recommendations come from. And they have increasingly, I, I pat myself on the back though, I have no reason to believe that this is because of my suggestion. They've increasingly done that. They still have these gigantic tables, but you can read an article and know what they think is worth having. And Wirecutter does the same thing. I, their criteria might not be the same as yours, but they explain themselves so you can decide, well, you know, I don't care how noisy a dishwasher is. So I'm just going to ignore that aspect of their evaluation. Other people might care. So you, you can get a sense of why they come to their judgments without having to just follow them slavishly. And the key thing about both of those uh, organizations is that they are not for profit Mm. They are not beholden to the product products they're evaluating. And what that means is that they can maintain their credibility. Totally. Uh, and it's become almost impossible to f feel that way about anything online. The, the, the striking exception to that, in my view, is Wikipedia, which interestingly, whatever its imperfections may be, it's also nonprofit. Yeah. And, and as a matter of principle, so they have never compromised their standards and they are really doggedly committed to doing what they want, what they are intending to do as well as they can on a, essentially a shoestring budget. And it's amazing because every other website you can think of has lost or search engine has lost credibility. Yeah, they're all, everybody's on the take. 
They're all everyone's on take. on the take, and Wikipedia is not, and and it's not an accident that they've remained maintained their integrity. Now, Barry, we're going to move on to the lightning round. Okay, because I have four questions for you. So let's get going right now. Four questions. This is Passover. <laughs> uh, die, die, Yenu. Is that what is that what we're doing here? <laughs> all right. So number one, what is a favorite quote that you like? An economist named Fred Hirsch said this years ago, the more that is written in contracts, the less can be expected without them. In other words, contracts have replaced trust. And we're all the worse off for it. Number two, name one book besides your own that every FOMO sapiens should read. <sighs> Well, I think the one that's had the biggest influence on me is an old book called The Great Transformation, written by um, an economic historian named Karl Polanyi. He was writing after, right after World War II. Wow. He explains how capitalism began and how it transformed the nature of society. So I think it's a pretty, he's after a pretty big fish, and it just changed the way I see everything in the world. Wow. Okay. That's a great one. I didn't even, I'd not heard of that. No, I mean, it's a million years old. Number three, what is one piece of advice you would give your younger self? Well, I think what I said to you a few minutes ago, good enough is good enough. For sure. And finally, what is your most important memory? <sighs> it is... The day I went with my best friend to an amusement park in Westchester and managed to convince her that she should stop being my best friend and start being my girlfriend. I had been making this argument unsuccessfully for quite some time. And then on that day, somehow she saw the, <laughs> she saw the light and we've been married for 57 years. It is so hard to break out of the friend zone. That is impressive. <laughs> it's true. It, you know, we became best friends in junior high school. And, you know, it didn't help that I was like I weighed 190 pounds in my five and a half foot body. You know, I was hardly a catch. But yeah. she, I had to convince her to see past what I looked like to my core. And uh, eventually she did. And then I lost weight to sort of give her a gift for having been so charitable to me. Wow. So that, that I think, is my most memorable. I mean, certainly it's the moment that had the biggest impact on the direction my life took. She did not have the paradox of choice. She made her choice. She made her choice years ago. and stuck with it. <laughs> All right. Barry Schwartz, author of The Paradox of Choice, and just uh, the master of all things choice. Thank you so much for being here. It's really been a pleasure. And I hope you don't mind that I steal FOMO every chance I get when I give talks these days. I'm giving you a, a, a free option. No, you don't have to pay me for that. Just use it in good health. Ah, thank you. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.